All right, let's go to our uh, lesson for this evening. Uh, as we get started, I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 12. Matthew, chapter 12. And notice the words of the Lord Jesus. In verse 38, the scribes and Pharisees say to him, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Bless you. And he said to them in verse 39, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Uh, verse 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now notice verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Um, I'm going to spring off of those verses this evening. <clears throat> it's, the Lord Jesus was upbraiding the Jews and the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes in his day, for not having the faith in God that the Old Testament saints did. Did. Um, the Queen of the South, however far she traveled, traveled a, a great distance to hear of Solomon's wisdom. And when she was there, she saw all the splendor of his kingdom, great picture or foreshadow of the kingdom of Jesus Christ over the world one day. But uh, the kingdom of Solomon was known far and wide around the known world at that time. And... Um, <clears throat> But the later generations did not exhibit the kind of faith that she did to travel so far to hear the word of God's man, God's king, uh, or, or the men of Nineveh repenting at the preaching of Jonas, where people resent the idea of preaching or the idea of the Bible being uh, explained and taught to them uh, and them now having to make a decision what to do with that knowledge. People many times want to be ignorant of the scriptures because they think it, it absolves them from any responsibility, any obligation to act on what they've been uh, taught. And uh, the kind of faith that modern day, present day believers have is so pathetic compared to the faith in God and the power of prayer and the power of the Word of God that Christians had just 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, you wonder if the generation today knows anything about trusting God by faith and uh, pleading with God by prayer and patience to see God act and move on their behalf. And I'm saying all of that because I want to take up a subject that it's sort of connected to what we talked about last week. <clears throat> last week, <clears throat> I brought up the subject of whether or not Simon Peter was the true rock or the foundation on which Christ's church was to be built. Was he the first pope? And I hope I gave enough scriptural argument as to why he's not the first pope, wasn't the first pope and uh, that the office of the papacy is not scriptural at all. Tonight, I want to take up the uh, title I give this, uh, Catholics We Can Agree With. Catholics We Can Agree With. And I'm going back about five years. I think I brought this as a Sunday afternoon lesson. But uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, one of their Catholic saints, Gregory of Nyssa, died in 394 A.D. He was a Catholic priest in the region of 
Cappadocia, which is due north of Israel, due north of Syria, right there near the border of Armenia today. And he once said, just as those at sea who have been carried away from the direction of the harbor they are making for, regain the right course by the clear sign of some beacon or mountain peak, so the scripture guides those adrift on the sea of life back to the harbor of God's will. And we would say amen to that. I don't find a single thing wrong with that. That's better preaching than uh, most modern day quote unquote ministers can offer. King David wrote, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, verse 105. And so, as I say, I call this lesson tonight, Catholics we can agree with. Saint Jerome, that's how he's uh, known, died in 420 AD. He's most famous for having translated the Bible into Latin, the old Latin Vulgate, Saint Jerome's translation, which was the official Catholic Bible for centuries in Latin. Of course, there were old Latin copies of the Bible before his, but they've been largely ignored over the centuries. But he's known as a doctor of the church. That's a lofty title to describe someone who helped formulate their uh, earliest beliefs and their positions on many things. But in an old prayer attributed to him, he said, O Lord, who has given us thy word for a light to shine upon our path, grant us to meditate upon that word and to follow its teaching that we may find in it the light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, borrowing from Pro uh, Proverbs 4, verse 18. And we would agree with that. There, St. Athanasius, <clears throat> who was also regarded as a church father, uh, Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, died in 373 A.D. He said, I think the Psalms are like a mirror in which one can see oneself and the movements of one's own heart. And um, Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s, a Baptist minister in London, England, <clears throat> said words very similar that Christians read all the Bible, but they live in the Psalms because there's so much in the book of Psalms that touches on the day-to-day -day, uh, feelings and emotions and struggles and the ups and downs and trials of life that everybody uh, experiences and the problems everyone encounters. But we can agree with um, those words. <clears throat> we read these words in the Psalms, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Psalm 139, verse 23. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 14. We can agree with uh, his sentiments about the Psalms. But there, St. Athanasius also said something else, that no Catholic defender today would stand to. <clears throat> the Holy Scriptures given by inspiration of God are of themselves, sufficient to the discovery of the truth. And this is what Roman Catholic apologists and Roman Catholic writers uh, would take issue with. <clears throat> the idea that the Bible alone is enough to teach a Christian how to live, or that it's sufficient to instruct uh, a church as to how to conduct its affairs and how to deal with any issues that come up, <clears throat> how to serve the Lord. The Latin phrase was... <clears throat> Sola Scriptura, the Scriptures alone. And that was a real rallying cry during the Protestant Reformation. Let me read to you a quote from a book called The Faith of Millions. This was written in 1937 by a Catholic priest named uh, John O'Brien. He said, A competent guide for the Christian religion should possess these three qualifications. It should be within the reach of every inquirer after truth. Number two, it should be clear and understandable to all. Number three, it should contain all the truths 
of the Christian faith. And I suppose we would agree with those qualifications. Then he says, now the Bible alone possesses none of these. It's not clear and understandable to all, and it doesn't present all the truths of the Christian faith. I think Father O'Brien and St. Athanasius would have a strong disagreement. That's why I started off by saying the uh, present-day representatives of any group, any movement, uh, don't have very much in common with their forebears, the ones they look to and say, these people are the reason we're here now. Their work decades and generations ago uh, have brought us to this point, and we owe everything to them. Sort of like these uh, nitwits today who don't believe in free speech, and yet that is the, one of the hallmarks of the United States Constitution, is it, it guarantees the right to free speech. Along with that, the freedom to practice your religious faith. Unlike any other country uh, in the history of the world, people risk their lives to come here for the sake of just those two freedoms alone, those two liberties alone. But um, when a Catholic apologist or Catholic writer uh, complains about the weakness of sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, um, how Christians can't depend only on the Bible, that's nothing more than a clever dodge to try to change the subject and to cover up the fact that they don't know anything about the Bible anyway. That's what it comes down to. They admit by, by their own lips that they are not as well versed in the Bible as a lot of fundamentalists, a lot of Baptists, Bible Christians are. I've heard Catholic uh, speakers say that, that uh, obviously the uh, Bible Christians spend a lot more time reading the Bible than most Catholics do, but then, then they'll try to pass over that quickly and justify their ignorance anyway. But uh, the last thing a Roman Catholic wants to do is engage in a conversation with you about what the Bible says. They want to tell you, remember, you know how often I've said, I don't want to know what the Bible means and I don't want to know what the Bible teaches. I want to know what the Bible says. And the right teaching should logically follow. But they don't want to do that. <clears throat> they want to appeal to their church. The church has declared such and such, such and such. Uh, and they assure us that it's scriptural, so I don't have to, I don't have to look it up myself and confirm it and double check on my own. I just trust the church to be telling me the truth. Well, that's your first mistake. But <clears throat> the last thing a Catholic wants to do is engage in a real uh, argument or debate. I don't mean argument in a negative sense, but a discussion of truth versus falsehood from the Bible. What does the Bible actually say, not what do you think it's supposed to mean? And St. Jerome, the uh, Latin Vulgate fame, <clears throat> is reputed to also said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And we would agree with that. In fact, the two become inseparable in the life of a true believer over the course of his lifetime. Christ is called the Word of God, John chapter 1. <clears throat> There's another Catholic Church father, St. Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215 A.D. He's also said to have been the fourth uh, Catholic Pope, uh, Simon Peter being the first and St. Clement uh, the fourth. But <clears throat> he said, As the sun illumines not only the heaven and the whole world, shining on both land and sea, but also sends his rays through windows and small chinks in the furthest recesses of a house. So the word, poured out everywhere, beholds the smallest actions of human life. He said the written words, behold, the smallest actions of human life. Paul wrote, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Speaking of the word of God, Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. They each describe the scriptures as having personality, and uh, we would agree with that uh, opinion. 
Another church father, John Chrysostom, died in 407 A.D., Archbishop of Constantinople, also known as Istanbul, Turkey. He became famous as a preacher and a commentator on the Pauline epistles and the Gospels of Matthew and John. And he insisted on the Antioch tradition of the literal meaning of Scripture and its uh, practical application in daily life, according to the Oxford Dictionary of Saints. He said, It's a great thing, this reading of Scriptures, for it is not possible to ever exhaust the mind of the Scriptures. It is a well that has no bottom. Man, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find some uh, goon on Calvary Chapel's radio station or most preachers these days say such things about the Bible. Because for so many um, supposed ministers and clergy of churches, the Bible is simply a message. And it doesn't matter which version you read. It doesn't matter how much you commit to memory. It's just sort of a general message about God's goodness, his love for us. Uh, the rest will, will, will fill in the blanks for you. You don't need to become um, so obsessed with reading the Bible. I remember um, back around 1984, 85, I was working at a place here in Ontario. We had a guy, it was a machine shop. We had a guy in there, and he knew I was a Christian. He knew, uh, came to church here and knew uh, some things about me, but he was always referring to me, uh, calling me Bible Thumper, the Bible Thumper on the job. And he thought it was real funny. He'd say that uh, in front of somebody who thought he thought he could get a laugh from. And I said, you know, Mio Chico, uh, <clears throat> there's two kinds of people in the world. There are those the people like you who seem to know everything there is to know about the Bible. And then there are other people like me who actually read it. I didn't have any more problems with the guy. The guy never said a word after that. But sometimes you have to push back. You know, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. <clears throat> but uh, understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, Proverbs 16, 22. The wellspring of wisdom is as a flowing brook, Proverbs 18, verse 4. So John Chrysostom uh, was, was right on when he described the scriptures as a well that has no bottom. And St. Augustine another famous doctor of the Catholic Church, formulating their theology, died in 430 A.D. His ideas were much like John Calvin's, 1,100 years later, uh, as far as God's sovereign election, and things must happen because God so ordered them to happen, and therefore man must not have free will at all. But everything happens because God had orchestrated it ahead of time, good and bad. But uh, nevertheless, he once said, In the Old Testament, the new is concealed. In the New Testament, the old is revealed. And I suppose we would agree with that too. Um, there's so much in the Old Testament that people can't make heads or tails of unless they have the New Testament and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the uh, future uh, coming again of Jesus Christ to make sense of what the uh, Hebrew prophet said centuries and centuries ago. But the New Testament, the New Testament writers quoted from the Old Testament over 200 times in the New Testament in order to show prophecy being fulfilled uh, right before their eyes or make some application to the ministry of Christ or the ministry of the, the life of a Christian. And St. Clement of Alexandria, um, hence the name San Clemente, he also briefly said, explain the scriptures by the scriptures. We say that here. Let the compare scripture with scripture and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. Peter said, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. 
which of course the Roman Catholic Church seems to uh, specialize in. And we certainly uh, agree with that approach. Christ prayed to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, verse 17. He told his apostles, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So, not only are the scriptures said to be God's truth, Christ said he was God's truth, and he was the life of God, and um, that his words were the words of life. St. Jerome was right. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. You can get saved without knowing much of the Bible. If you understand the gospel that Christ was God in the flesh, living among men and suffered for the sins of men with no sins of his own. And therefore, when he was punished, he was being punished on your behalf. But you don't want to stay ignorant of the Bible for the rest of your days. The more you, uh, once you are truly regenerated by the saving power of God and the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, you should naturally want to know as much about the Lord as you can. You suddenly have an interest in reading the Bible like you never had before. Probably a, a new interest. You can't even explain it. Why am I interested in this that I, I, I could have cared less two weeks ago, three weeks ago? But uh, Paul wrote, we are to be comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2.13. And so just like St. Clement said, explain the scriptures by the scriptures. And that's certainly our position. St. Jerome of a Latin Vulgate uh, fame wrote, The apostles at that time first preached the gospel, but later, by the will of God, they delivered it to us in the scriptures that it, that it would be the, the gospel written in the scriptures, that it might be the foundation and pillar of our faith. Wait a minute. I thought Simon Peter was the foundation on which the church of Christ was going to be built. So St. Jerome uh, comes awfully close to contradicting the official Catholic line. One of the main doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, which was solidified Vatican I in 1870, is that Peter was the rock, and uh, the church was built on him, not built on Christ, not built on Peter's testimony of Jesus Christ and, and all that meant, but it was built on Peter himself uh, and his chosen successors. But that view of Peter's supposed authority was not universally uh, accepted in 1870 at Vatican I Council. Prior to that, there was no official dogma of the infallibility of the Pope. I'm certain, certain a lot of people wanted to believe that and it helped to promote the, uh, the authority of their religion because you had the Catholic states and so many countries in Europe that were just controlled by the, the papacy <clears throat> And they were whittled down to a small little city-state in uh, 19, I want to say 1930, uh, Vatican uh, State of Vatican City or City of Vatican State. Uh, and they lost uh, dominance of all of these nations around. They were restricted by the rest of the world to uh, their own city-state right in the city of Rome, Italy. But when they thought there was no stopping them, they tried to elevate their man to effectively to the level of deity in the eyes of their, their faithful followers. <clears throat> but not everyone agreed with that. At Vatican I in 1870, <clears throat> they voted to approve this doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. But not all the cardinals that were represented there, that rep were there, um, shared that view. And so afterwards, they went off and uh, in their, now they are Roman Catholic and loyal to the Catholicism in every respect. They just don't accept the idea that the Pope is infallible when he says something that Catholics are supposed to believe. And they are what's 
sometimes referred to as the Old Catholic Order, the Old Catholic Church, meaning that they held the old belief before the infallibility thing was made official. So you might even argue that they're more uh, officially Catholic than the ones who adopted the infallibility idea. But um, <clears throat> St. Jerome's state, uh, statement could only mean that the written scriptures were to be regarded as of greater authority than simply the, than even the apostles' spoken word. He said at first they went out preaching, and then by the will of God they delivered the, the gospel to us in the scriptures. And what did he say about that? That, that uh, the scriptures, that it might be the foundation and pillar of our faith. So our faith is built on what we read on the pages of the scriptures. Their faith is, is built and based upon the uh, opinions of men, which change every couple of decades when one dies and another comes along, um, and so on. I've often wanted to ask Mormons, for example, when your church president or your church prophet dies, does that mean your church is without a teaching prophet until you elect another one? If so, then who is the ultimate voice of God overseeing your religion? I suppose you could say the same thing about the Roman Catholic uh, transfer of, of authority from pope to pope. But if, if St. Jerome's statement meant that the scriptures are to be regarded as greater authority than the spoken words of the apostles, that would include Simon Peter, because he was one of the apostles. St. Thomas Aquinas, you may have heard his name, died in 1274 A.D. He was an Italian Dominican monk. He's also considered a doctor of Catholic Church doctrine. He believed and wrote about the doctrine of the real presence, how the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ in their Mass. But be that as it is, he stated, there can be no falsehood anywhere in the literal sense of Holy Scripture. Uh, his mistake was going so, was taking it so literally and not comparing the Scriptures with the Scriptures like he was like another saint told him to do. He took it so literally that when Jesus said, this is my body, that has to be taken literally in his mind. Uh, that, that wine in the cup was his real blood. That has to be taken literally. And so he set out to formulate how this doctrine could be taught. In the preface to the Wycliffe Bible, back in 1395, in protest to the Catholic Church, long before the Protestant Reformation was underway. That Bible stated, Though our covetous clerics are altogether carried away by bribery, heresy, and many other sins, and though they despise and oppose the Scripture as much as they can, yet the common people cry out for the Scripture to know it and obey it with great cost and peril to their lives. That's probably true. I think, and I've said this recently, I think most Roman Catholic people want to believe that the practices of their church, the things they're taught to do, the things they profess to believe in, um, and the things they learn in their catechism, and things that they're led to believe in through their church's functions, I think most Roman Catholics want to believe that their beliefs are, are based on the scriptures. I think they do. I wouldn't deny that at all. And uh, it's very unfortunate that that they, they're afraid to read the Bible on their own. It has to be filtered through the church's opinion, the priest. If not the priest, then the bishop. And if not the bishop, then the College of Cardinals. And uh, then the Pope, ultimately. But... Um, the, the idea that they um, are carried away with heresy and bribery and many other sins. That sounds a lot like the actions of leading Roman Catholics today. 
There's some article, I didn't have time to read it before we came to church tonight. Um, one Catholic bishop who spoke out against uh, child abuse um, when that was in the news every day a few years back has now himself been accused of child abuse um, and so on. They had to run uh, Cardinal Mahoney out of town because he hadn't handled the sexual abuse scandal of the Los Angeles Archdiocese. Um, cost the Los Angeles Archdiocese over $600 million in um, settlement payments to all these victims that were coming out of the woodwork uh, years and decades uh, after the fact. You, know, you can't have a guy in charge of a, the nation's largest uh, archdiocese uh, who lets that kind of bad uh, publicity uh, get in the newspapers and cost the church uh, you know, almost a, almost two thirds of a billion dollars. But um, let me conclude with a quote by a Saint Basil, Caesarea. You remember him, right? He died in 379 A.D. He's also known as Basil the Great. He was also a doctor of the Catholic Church. He helped to form their theology for many centuries after. But St. Basil once asked, What is the mark of faith? Unhesitating conviction in the truth of the inspired words. What is the mark of a believer? To hold fast by such conviction in the strength of what Scripture says and to dare neither to set it at naught nor to add to it. Well, we would agree with that. And... Um, the Bible has living personality, according to St. Clement. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ, according to St. Jerome. The scriptures themselves are sufficient to teach us what we should know, St. Athanasius. They should be interpreted literally, according to John Chrysostom and Thomas Aquinas. We ought to explain the scriptures by the scriptures, according to St. Clement. The written scriptures are to be the foundation and pillar of our faith, according to St. Jerome. The real mark of a believer is his unwavering confidence in the written words of God to be true, according to St. Basil. These men summarize nearly everything Bible believers hold to even now. So these are a few Catholics we can actually agree with.